I'm here today uh, because I am a gamer. Um, you know, I think to this, it really just speaks to the level of passion that I have for choosing games as my predominant form of entertainment. Um, it's also participating in games and participating in, in video game and virtual world environments has also shaped a lot of how I think about online product development. Um, you know, I am completely new to the health industry. I've only been in the industry nine months now. Prior to this, I did a couple of gaming startups. And, uh, and in gaming speak, we call this being a huge noob, um, which means that you know, I'm, just, I, I'm still trying to figure out the challenges of this industry, the products of this industry. And as I've been out and, and talking to people and looking at products and participating with many of you all, um, I've started to see that we're all here really to solve um, a common problem. And that is the engagement problem. Um, the engagement problem is there and we can't figure out how to crack it. I mean, there is no shortage of great science and well-designed interventions and best of intentions built into the online products that we are deploying today. Um, but we can't seem to figure out how to get people to use them. Uh, you know, one of the ways at which we've been trying to do this is with incentives, um, where we pay people billions of dollars a year to use this product. And going back to something that Melinda Gates said in the, in the opening video, I mean, we often think, well, if you need it, you know, we don't have to really market it to you. We don't have to really convince you. Um, so maybe we'll just pay you instead um, to use the product. And you know, coming from gaming, I mean, this goes pretty counter to, uh, to what I know, where in the gaming industry, people pay billions of dollars a year to use these products. Um, they pay them to the game company. So when we see that, we look at that and we say, well, obviously, there's something to learn there. Obviously, there's something that we should be able to utilize that makes our products in health and wellness as equally engaging as what's bringing people to games. And I think that's why games are so hot right now in the health space. I mean, Games for Health and the whole initiative around trying to build game mechanics into things. I mean, you'll hear about the gamification of, of life and all these different aspects. Um, you know, that's why it's hot, because we want that engagement that, that games provide. We want those, uh, that same level of engagement in our health and wellness products. But before we do that, we sort of have to ask, why do people play games? There's me rocking the power glove. Um, <laughs> You know, why do people play games? I mean, the, the easiest thing to say is, well, games are fun. That's why people play games, because they're fun. And if we can make health and, product, health and wellness products more fun, then people will use our products too. Uh, if we just made it more fun to run, if we just made it more fun to eat better, if we just made it more fun to do these things, then we could do exactly what games do. Um, but I think it goes deeper than this. We can't lump games together into one gigantic bucket. There's lots of different types of games. On the one hand, you have very simple, trivial games like Solitaire and Minesweeper that you might play on your computer at work and, and hide it. Or you might you know, play Facebook casual you know, Facebook games that are all the rage in the, in the, in the news these days. Um, but there's also another type of game, games that go much deeper than that. These are games that people stick with. These are Massive multiplayer online gaming titles. They cost millions of dollars to make. People play them for hours a day. They play them for years at a time. They meet their spouses in these games. They have real, genuine, human, emotional experiences within these products. So when we talk about trying to build health and wellness products, I'm not so interested in, in the products that are just on the surface fun. We want to figure out what is it about these deeper types of games that really engage people. Now, I'm not a game researcher, um, but there's a man by the name of Dr. Richard Bartle, who is a game researcher, and he's also a pioneer. He built one of the first text-based online role-playing games called a multi-user dungeon in the 80s, um, and it, it's uh, called a MUD. And in these games, you know, you would go in, you would you know, uh, be in quests, you would participate with other people, and he was really interested in that, why were people playing these games? Um, as a designer, he wanted to know how to make these games better. How do I create better experiences for people? And when he looked inside of these games, he was fascinated that people weren't doing the fun stuff. They were oftentimes doing the very boring, repetitive things, or they were just sort of hanging out in a pub and chatting to people and paying lots of money to do this. They weren't even playing the game. And as he dug into this and he started to look at who these people were and why were they coming to these gaming products, uh, he started to, to discover that there were certain gamer preferences. There are certain things that people demand of these experiences that actually engage them in this product. If you play games, you are probably 
one of these types, predominantly one of these types of things. You might be an explorer. You might be someone who is really interested in immersion of the game, getting into the product, exploring the story, participating in the cohesive narrative, um, exploring the entire virtual world, looking under every rock, and finding the things that other people don't find. And then ultimately, you become fulfilled as a knowledge resource for other people within the game. You've explored, you've gained the knowledge, people come to you to ask, where do I go to do and find these things within this virtual world? You also have your achievers. These are people who just like to get things. They like to get the best stuff. They like to you know, get the, all of the trophies, all of the badges. Um, they also like to adorn themselves with the, the fruits of their labor. So they have the best sword on their virtual back, and they have the best shield. And you know, these, a lot of times, these people will often pay large sums of money on eBay for the best battle axe and, and things like that. Um, so for these people, it's really about getting that next thing. Then you have your socializers. These are the people that often talk about the exploits of the achievers and the explorers. Um, but these people are extremely motivated by the politics of interpersonal communication and interaction. They like to form groups. They like to have hierarchy. They like to have social status. And so for them, the game is really just an environment that brings everyone together under this collective experience and allows people to tell stories about it. And finally, you have your killers. These are the people who like destruction. They like competition. They like head-to-head -head skill of mastery. And it's important. These people don't play against the computer. Um, for, for true people who, who like the killer persona, they're ones that like it to be competition against real people. It's about you know, me versus you going head-to-head -head and one of us coming out on top. And if I can't win, then I'm going to you know, sabotage your win anyway and, uh, and do everything that they can. So. When Richard Bartle um, you know, did this, this study, uh, he ended up finding that people weren't playing his games because they were fun. He was pl they were playing these games because ultimately they were fulfilled. They were fulfilled in these different areas. And it's that fulfillment, I think, that we need to seek out within our, our health and wellness products. And so when I learned about this, I mean, I was most excited because I feel like this maps really well to a lot of different types of successful products. And if we can learn from this and bring this into a health and wellness context and build products around well-being that engage people using fulfillment, um, then we can get farther than I think we've ever been. And so instead of thinking of these as gamer preferences, start to think of them as fulfillment mechanics that we can apply to our products. Um, and we don't just do one of them or two of them. We think about applying them all. And it's often helpful to think of this in a continuum. And so think about deploying uh, a well-being product online, you know, into the web, into the ether. And think about the experience that someone has as they in engage with that product. So when you first show up, we're all explorers. right? We don't know what well-being means. You know, we might have a very narrow definition of it as physical and nutritional. We might um, you know, not understand that it also takes into, a fact, into account health optimism, life evaluation, work environment, social connections, emotional health issues. So we're all in the process of learning and, and discovering these things. So we all have a sort of a need and a sense for exploration. Once we start to learn and explore, if there's no framework for that, there's no real sense of progress. And that's where achievement comes in. Achievement allows us to create frameworks for learning that give us a sense of progression. So as we learn things, we feel like we're going somewhere. It's not just a big list of all these things I have to read. It's that I'm being stepped through some process. And so I can gain a sense of, of fulfillment from the achievements that I'm getting through this learning process. And naturally, once I start to achieve, I want to share this knowledge. I want to celebrate these achievements. And so that's where the socializing comes in. Now I, I want to talk with people about these, this knowledge I've learned. I want to share these achievements that I've done. And so this isn't socializing in the post-Facebook 110 friends type of way. This is sharing in a really genuine context, because I've actually learned something I want to share, or I've actually achieved something I care about, about celebrating. And as we start to socialize within these environments, we naturally start to become familiar with each other. Uh, and it's that familiarity that breeds the best type of competition for health and wellness products. We're talking about hyper-local type of friendly rivalry competitions. Um, not you know, purely anonymized types of competition where it's you know, a bunch of random people competing against a bunch of random people. About building a context where this competition happens in a really genuine way. And the thing about competition, when it occurs that way, is it becomes a feedback loop for all of the other fulfillment mechanics. 
When I compete, it gives me more achievements to talk about and celebrate, you know, beating a friend. Um, it causes more socializing to occur as we talk about the competition that happened and how it all went down. And it motivates me to explore and learn more because now I want to increase my sense of mastery to be able to compete better with other people. And so we have to do all of these things within this continuum. We have to provide all of them. If we only provide one of them, it immediately leads to a fairly trivial experience. I mean, thinking about a health and wellness product that is 100% competition. Um, think about a health and wellness product that is, is purely social. It has no guidance on, on content or framework. It doesn't take advantage of any of the great science or interventions that we can, we can build into it. So we think about this, we have to figure out how to put all of these in together. That's what the best games do. That's what makes the best games, is they have all of these things for all people. And the real secret of all of this, when you do this, when you create these really fulfilling experiences, is that it, it transcends being a product. I mean, that's what games do really well. When you're passionate about gaming, just as if you're passionate about photography or gardening or running or biking, it's what you talk about at work. It's what you talk about on your lunch break. It's what you talk about at a barbecue. It's what you read news about throughout the day on, on websites and, and blogs. And so it stops being a game. It becomes more than that. It stops being a hobby. It becomes more than that. You become passionate about it. It becomes a part of your identity. And that's the business that we need to be in. I mean, a lot of times I hear it say, well, we're in the behavior change business. Um, but I think it goes deeper than that. The, we want to be in the business that the gaming industry is in, and, and that's really the passion creation business. We want to be the products that people talk about at barbecues. We need to form our content in a way that allows people to explore it just like they explore virtual worlds. We need to figure out how to add in sequences of achievement that allow people to get an immediate sense of progress and momentum. And we need to create a system for people to have really genuine social conversations about these achievements. And we need to offer an opportunity for friendly competition once that socializing occurs and that those friendly rivalries start to develop. And we can nurture them into more learning, more exploration, more achievement. And so that's why I'm really excited to be in this industry. I know I'm new. only been here a couple of months. Um, but I'm really excited about trying to figure out how we build the next generation of health and wellness products with that passion, how we use these four fulfillment mechanics to really create a set of next generation well-being products that engage people and make them passionate about health and wellness. Thank you. <laughs>